What's up everyone? Welcome back to TV Worm, the only late night talk show dedicated to film here in Breezo Hall. I'm your host, Mary Reffitt, and this week we'll be delving into the human spectacle displayed in Squid Game, a Korean drama created by Hong Doing Hook. Squid Games is a Korean drama that features Hong Ji Hun, a man of little money who is given the opportunity of a lifetime to participate in games that he would soon find out are literally fight to the death. For out of the 456 participants there are, there can only be one survivor. Now, what you'll learn is that all these characters are in the same predicament as he is, and there's a wide array of cast, so let's get into them. First, there's Song Ji Hun, a father that lives with his mother, steals her money, and bets on horses. There's Cho Seng Woo, uh, Ji Hun's childhood friend, who was successful in com- college as a businessman, but would later find himself in too many risky deals. And finally, there's Kong Se Byuk, a North Korean refugee who's trying to make a better life for her and her brother. Now, all these characters face debt, uh, beyond fixing in the normal sense of things. Uh, and have resorted to any means necessarily uh, to erase their troubles. So, with that being said, how does Squid Games represent the humanistic qualities in, say, a class based on animals, people, and power? Great question. Uh, Squid Games is a spectacle uh, meant to incite emotions to the watcher as well as foster conversations on humanity. And the narrator, or the narrative of the show shows humans being dehumanized, treated as animals, and used as a tool for powerful uh, people. All three, which are themes of the course. Now, I begin my research project with three questions and a piece of paper, literally. How does the animal portrayed in Squid Games represent both the oppressed and the oppressor? How do the animalized and dehumanized participants show humanity through these struggles? And three, how do these forms of media showcase the human struggle and make commentary on real life power struggles and systems of oppression? And what is this saying about, say, systems such as capitalism, which is a highly debated topic in humanities courses? Um, I eventually led my research with the idea that I wanted to evaluate mainly why uh, people participate in these games and how people use this information to potentially manipulate those um, to do what they want. And what evolved through these conversations with my peers, with my teachers, with just anyone in general really, is that there's a connection to the human royale we know very well, The Hunger Games by Suzanne Collins. I found um, a lot of the power struggles that are displayed in the books and films would make a very good comparison uh, to Squid Games, and I wanted to explore how both works complement each other. Um, and showcase the oppressive forces in a way that, um, you know, sold to the higher and more privileged class compared to those who were being worked and dehumanized and used for the upper classes entertainment and gain. Um, I then wanted to examine how that affected us, the viewers' ideals on society, things like capitalism, and then how they fit into this world. Um, would would we participate in games if we were given the opportunity? And this led me to my thesis. Uh, Squid Game is a show that depicts the commodification, agency stripping, dehumanization, and animalization of its characters. Huang Doing Kyuk, in an interview with Variety, expressed his aim for the show as a story that was an allegory or fable about modern capitalist society, something that depicts an extreme competition. When analyzing Squid Game's ensemble of characters under varying conditions, as well as the game's naturally demeaning nature, stripping participants of their suits of self, you see the class consciousness displayed in the anti-capitalist message Huang wishes to narrate. In comparison to other human ROLs, like Hunger Games, uh, you begin to understand that the message behind the screen is one meant to spark dialogue between the viewers, asking themselves if this is a world worth participating in, or how they would enact change. Viewers are ultimately asked to challenge your values and are given a warning of fighting such exploitations. So what? Why is this important? Why am I speaking to you with gummy worms behind me at 12, 16 in the morning? I think this is very important to analyze how different audiences can interpret these forms of media differently. 
If, if it was a general consciousness that the show was a re representative of something depressing, then that would be the end of discussion. But it is the fact that Squid Game exists in a realistic universe that we must wonder if we are being treated like the main ensemble, even metaphorically. It makes the tale more dreadful, as we realize that in the future, games like this could happen, it could exist, and people could be so drawn to playing off debt that they would risk their humanity. I first started by researching the, the psychology of the players themselves, because if you wish to do an analysis of the morality of how the games and the game masters are, you must first tackle the obstacle of understanding how the characters got to where they were, how they were affected, and push to the state of making such decisions in the first place. So, I asked things such as how these humans with very phallic fears were pushed to the brink of their humanity and then stripped of it. And I found through a book called Moral Character and Empirical Theory by Christian T. Miller, which is a contemporary psychologist, um, you begin to understand the actions as both predetermined and a reaction to the environment, such as in the first game, Red Light, Green Light, when they're literally seeing themselves being trampled on, stomped, and shot down in the masses. And we also found out that humans are not purely virtuous or vicious, but somewhere in between. And this is somewhere that we can see in episode 6 of Squid Games, actually, um, in the Marvel game. There we see uh, Sung Byuk uh, be very sad when the other player that she got to know, player 240, uh, risk her life to save Sai Byuk. Um, we also saw Sang Woo, who used Ali, another character, to win by tricking him and deceiving him. Someone who did not do anything to hurt anyone else, but was still a victim. And then you see uh, Jihon, who no matter what, did not want to sacrifice another human, yet in episode 6, made the realization that if he was to win, he would have to trick the old man who was declining cognitively. Another thing you had to explore was gambling, the beginning of the commodification of the players from the VIPs as they are preyed on for being the most likely to play the games even when given the option to leave. And they had the most compelling reasons to really stay and fight, and doing so meant they were the most entertaining to the VIPs and the most marketable. When understanding, I read a book called, from Jim Orford called An Unsafe Bet, The Dangerous Rise of Gambling and the Debate We Should Be Having. Now, this English philosopher and psychologist really studied gambling, and what he found is that there's a perpetual cycle uh, where stress inhibits more gambling, which causes more stress, which of course causes more gambling, and so on and so forth. And for Jihun, his perpetual conflict internally was his relationship with his family. Unable to afford proper gifts, he stole from his mother, and not being able to fly to the US, he brought him to gamble even more of the little money he had in hopes to win it back. Another thing I researched was The Hunger Games, a very popular human royal, and in comparison to The Squid Games, how it exemplified the dichotomy between the oppressed and the oppressor, which is the highlight of the exploitive class and anti-class argument. Hunger Games showcases a post-colonial ideal. Post-colonial meaning in modern society or post the colonial age, there are still the effects of colonialism. And ideas such as marketing uh, for the games is an example, because the higher class society of the capital would prey upon the colonized districts. And Nelly Karingo, which is a film analysis YouTuber, uh, argued that agency is taken from the characters as they no longer worked for just themselves after winning, but instead their oppressors, similar to post-colonialism. And this is also a form of hybridity, where instead of the characters being winners or just bottom of the pack like they were before, they're now in a sense of in-between, where they no longer feel the same as themselves before, and now they work for the people that once oppressed them. And another thing that was discovered from the Hunger Games is the Avoxes, who, when in comparison to the guards in Squid Games, are almost like subalterns. And subalterns, they're kind of working for the oppressor, but they're given no voice. And what's important about these subalterns is that it makes exposing the games difficult. It makes fighting back against the oppressors very difficult because there's no incentive to fight back. As you see in Hunger Games, the Avoxes, their tongues are cut out. As you see from the guards in Squid Game, they're shot. Going back to Squid Game, 
The dehumanization and animalization is displayed in the structure of the games themselves. They're stripped of their names and instead given numbers, and the only time their names are revealed is when they try to take back their humanity by working together and not working for just themselves. And another thing is the horse analogy. This is something I find very interesting. At the beginning of the show, Ji-hun is seen betting on horses, excited and, and, and watching intently as these horses rake in and work hard for his own entertainment and benefit. Now, at the end of the show, he's, he's seen declaring, I am not a horse as he realizes he has to fight back against these VIPs, and that the VIPs too were the ones watching them, like they were horses in a race. Hiding behind masks barred with vicious predator animals, the VIPs are shown acting out of their own humanity, and like many of the people in the games themselves, out of touch with their own character. Now, the viewer's perception on narratives in various medias are always going to be perceptive, and for Squid Game, it's always going to be people who believe that the anti-capitalist message is nothing more than a sentiment. One of those people that believe that is Sean Malone from the Foundation of Economic Education, very biased by the way, um, who argues that, well, the players chose to participate, they chose to play, and that this is nothing more than just a show showing the problems with over-governing, saying that the VIPs are actually a representation of the government as they were able to manipulate the game. Now a counter to this can be seen through various channels, one of them being Vosh, who is a kind of well-known political commentator. Now he argues that if it was pro-capitalist, why were the characters not shown overcoming the system? but instead they just learned how to master and control it. And another thing that was brought up is well, why do viewers have a deep sense of like discomfort when seeing this? And it's because in a way Squid Games is depicted in reality. In a way people are out there that would make the choice to play these games because they are in debt. And in real life we see this every day through mercenaries joining the military, etc. Now, another counter to the counter argument that it's not about capitalism is seen through Film Fatales, a YouTube channel, which argues that the visual analysis alone shows that there's a system of winning and losing in the game. There's stairs which almost represent class commentary, as some are able to climb the steps and some are never able to make it back down. Thanks for tuning into this episode of TV Worm, and until next time, this is Mary Reffitt, signing off.